Oh man, the enemy. They were there to die and they wanted to take as many Marines with them. I served in the Marine Corps from roughly 2001 to 2007, 2008. I was commissioned August 11th, 2001. I was an infantry officer. I was in 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines. Finished up my time at MARSOC and uh, loved my time in the Marine Corps. I always knew I wanted to serve. My, many of my grandparents had served. One of my grandparents had landed in Normandy uh, a little bit after D-Day and then fought his way across Europe in the Battle of the Bulge. My other grandfather uh, volunteered to serve in the U.S. Army in World War II at the age of 41. So I grew up with their stories. Uh, I also grew up around a lot of Holocaust survivors, and I always knew I wanted to serve. And then when I ended up at Cornell, I played a sport called lightweight football, which is football for those of us that are smaller in stature. And the football coach there was a guy named Terry Cohen. And Terry had served in the Marine Corps in Vietnam, Silver Star recipient, badly wounded, and he really encouraged me to join the Marine Corps as opposed to the other branches. So my first deployment, I was with 1-1, uh, and I went to Iraq uh, in the fall of 2003. Uh, with 1-1, I was on a MU, the 13th Marine Expeditionary Unit. And then coming home from that deployment, uh, my platoon sergeant and I, a guy named Nick Fox, still one of my closest friends, retired as a SAR major, he and I were sort of felt like we'd missed you know, the, the war at that point. Our battalion commander, a guy named uh, uh, Colonel Boudreau, and I asked him if I could uh, transfer over to 3-1, which was the next deploying unit. So myself and my platoon sergeant crossed over to 3-1. We got home, I think, from that deployment February or March, and then we were back out uh, by June of, of that, that year. Throughout the summer and the fall, we were doing feints into the city. So we would line up as if we were going to go into the city and we would attack maybe up to the edge of the city, maybe a block into the city. But really those were attempts to get the enemy to reorient their focus of efforts to the south of the city. And then when the actual attack happened, we came in through the, the north. And those feints were, were tough operations. I mean, Fallujah in Anbar in August and September is hot. Right, and so you're doing these operations, you're wearing, you know, 100, 120 pounds worth of gear. The, the temperatures are reaching 120, 130 degrees. And then you're contending with a very real enemy that knows the area, knows what they're doing, hides amongst the civilian population. And then at the time, we also had the presidential election. I don't think people knew exactly how that was gonna turn out, whether it was gonna be Kerry or whether it was gonna be Bush. Uh, but I think there was some certainty that once the election was over, um, I think there was even some talk about the moon cycle. We knew that we'd be getting the order to go into the city. You know, we were going to be attacking an enemy that had a lot of time to prepare for this fight. Fallujah was held by Al Qaeda. It was enemy held territory. And they were using Fallujah as a base of operations to terrorize Anbar and the rest of Iraq. So they were building truck bombs and car bombs. They were kidnapping folks and bringing them into the city and torturing them. I had a, a very, very good friend uh, who was a, one of my Iraqi officers, a guy named Major Abdelhadi, an amazing guy. And uh, one day he was kidnapped um, and brought into Fallujah. Uh, they severely tortured him and beaten, beat him. And Abdelhadi came back the day after he was released by Al Qaeda and his feet were broken. He couldn't put his boots on. Uh, they were so beaten. He had scars, you know, from where they had, they had whipped him and beat him. And then about, a, I think it was a year later, um, I'd been, I was working at the Pentagon at the time on the, the QDR. I got a note from a, an officer overseas that uh, Abdel Hadi had been kidnapped again and beheaded by, by the insurgents. You know, there was something that was familial about 3-1. It felt like home. It felt like a community. And I think that started with the leadership at the top with Colonel Buell. He was somebody who cared deeply for the Marines, deeply. When we were out at our own Ford operating base before going into the city, 
Uh, there'd be moments I'd get up, you know, in the middle of the night to go check the check the lines, check the, the, the posts around the base. And so often there'd be this short Marine that's up there just, you know, smoking and joking, having a conversation with another Marine up there, and it was the Colonel. He'd driven 20 kilometers from his base to just check the lines at all the different platoons that were they're stationed around the AO. And he set the standard that that our job is to to take care of our Marines and, and let them take care of the mission. And to this day, I mean, you know, as we're talking, like I'm just remembering some of these amazing Marines who I had the opportunity to serve with. You know, they fought hard, they were innovative, they were funny, they wanted to be there. And it's amazing to think about how young everybody was. You know, that's the other thing. I mean, we were, we were kids and yet they were sort of shouldering so much. And, uh, and to be one of them, uh, you know, is, is one of the, the proudest moments of my life. Is there a signature moment in Fallujah? Yeah. I mean, if I'm playing the tape, I mean, it is, it's moments with some of the Marines I served with, right? It's the moment with Hennessy with his back up against the wall, pleading with us to keep him in, even though he had a flesh wound, you know, at best. Um, and Hennessy was, you know, phenomenal Marine. It was, uh, you know, a, a suicide bomber who detonated himself just an instant too soon before you know the Marines were making entry into a building and blew himself up and fortunately they didn't hurt anybody. It was one of our Marines who, running up to a Marine who had been mortally injured and knowing that there was nothing we could do to save him but still sort of trying to do everything we could to save him. There was a moment where after we had this, this F-16 drop on us, None of us could hear shit. And the air was just filled with like concrete and dust. And Martinez hands me a cigarette and he's like, do you think we're still alive? You think we're just ghosts now gonna be walking around the city of Fallujah? Knowing it had been just that close. I mean, that, that 500 pound bomb fell 45 meters from our position. Right? The only reason we're still alive is because of the mitigating effects of urban terrain. It's getting to the edge of the city. Uh, I remember being on a rooftop with Corey Calvin Corey Calvin has an amazing story. He was on a rooftop uh, calling in fire. He leans forward to adjust the radio. At the same moment, a sniper round uh, is fired and it, it, it goes between the plate on his plate carrier and his back and he has a tattoo that says Marine. And the round underlines his Marine Corps tattoo. And so he then, you know, gets treated, he comes back and, you know, being up on the rooftop with him as we got to the edge of the city and knowing that, that this fight was over. You know, we just cleared the city. Oh, the human cost was immense. We were fighting an enemy that had turned houses into Japanese pillboxes, right, with machine guns. There was the loss of life. Uh, there was the the hidden wounds that resulted. You know, our battalion, we lost 33 Marines in, in Fallujah, about half our battalion, 576 Marines were wounded. Um, I think we've now lost 57 to suicide. You know, so there's, there, the, the cost has a long tail. Um, that was my transition, it wasn't easy. You know what? It wasn't. I, I went through a period where I was uh, I was pretty angry. You know, I stayed in for a couple more years. That helped, right? Because I was still in the Marine Corps, and so I think part of it was getting out of the Marine Corps, and then you're sort of out on your own. And, and PTSD takes a minute to catch up with you. And a lot of folks don't understand that PTSD is really just the inability to turn off the fight or flight response, right? So that's that's not a bad thing when you're in combat, right? Having uh, restlessness, um, hypervigilance, quickness to respond, hyperfocus, like those are all good things when you're in combat, right? And, and when you think about anxiety, anxiety is just your body preparing to react, right? Your heart's racing, you're sweating, your muscles are getting limber. Uh, when you come home though, not being able to turn that stuff off, that's not helpful. And, you know, I was fortunate that I was able to, you know, get some support that I needed and some help that I needed, but it wasn't easy at first. 
and you know, but you do the work and things do get better. You know, whether it's your career, whether it's your family, I've got the most amazing wife, four incredible kids. I'm able to show up for them as a father. I'm able to be present. I think the, the big ripple effect for me is that it completely changed the trajectory of my life. I thought I was gonna serve in the military and get out and do something completely different. That was, that was sort of my big dream is like, go make, you know, go work in the private sector, go start a business, but then retire and teach at some point in my life. I think what, what happened is, is that uh, for me, you know, it all started with the leadership and the folks that I served with and knowing that the responsibility to, to care for those that, that, that we fought alongside doesn't end when you come home. We started to lose a lot of Marines to suicide and uh, had a conversation with Colonel Buell, a battalion commander in New York City a few years later. I think it was like 2010, 2011. We'd lost maybe a dozen, dozen and a half Marines at that point. We just had a terrible suicide in a battalion where one of our, our sergeants came home, kissed his wife and, and kids at the dinner table, went upstairs, they heard a gunshot. And that led to doing a ton of work in the veteran space. You know, that led to starting the Headstrong Project, to finding a way like, could we address the hidden wounds of war? Could we find ways of treating PTSD? I'm very proud of the work Headstrong does right now. It's one of the largest providers of mental health for veterans. It's cost-free, bureaucracy-free, it's highly effective. And so in that sense, you know, that work, that, that's lifelong work, that never ends. One of the most important conversations I've, I've had in my life was um, I had a guy who was like an older brother figure to me named John Schlesinger. And, and John was killed in a car accident uh, decades ago. And it was at his funeral. So the rabbi pulled the young people aside and said that you all now have an op a responsibility to live your life for John. That there's so much life that John was not gonna be able to live, was gonna be able to start a family. Uh, things he wasn't gonna be able to do in his career, things he wasn't gonna be able to experience, an impact that he no doubt would have had that he wasn't able to have. And when we would lose somebody, uh, I would repeat those rabbi's words in Iraq. Whenever we'd lose a Marine, I'd, I'd pull the Marines in and I'd, I'd repeat that. For me, it's also a way of feeling like, you know, I was one of the lucky ones to come home. I lost my best friend over there, Ronnie Winchester, uh, that, in a war that it's it's hard to make sense of what we actually accomplished over there. That I think the real legacy is those of us who were lucky enough to come home, often because of the sacrifices of those who didn't, that we have our resp responsibility to live our lives a certain way to give meaning to their sacrifice. And that what we do now is really what's gonna give meaning to their lives.